So, when you're making a movie about a two-ton yellow car with feelings, how do you do that? Should you make it as realistic as possible, or should you bend the rules a little bit? Bumblebee is a 2018 film about a teenage girl, Charlie, who finds an old car that turns out to be a shape-shifting alien robot, or simply put, a transformer. The film follows the pair saving the world, of course, but it's also much more of a character-driven film than the previous Michael Bay Transformers movies. It relies on the connection between Charlie and Bumblebee, who doesn't speak due to an injury early in the film. Most of Bumblebee's communication has to do with messages being conveyed visually. So how exactly is that achieved? Before we dive into that, let's briefly look at another example, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You know the story. A girl named Snow White runs away from an evil queen and her huntsmen and meets seven dwarves in the woods. One of those dwarfs is Dopey. Like Bumblebee, Dopey doesn't talk. Everything about him is conveyed visually. When he's feeling scared, he does this. When he's feeling dazed, he does this. You don't hear him, you see him. The idea of visual communication connects back not only to early animation, but also early silent films from people like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. But we're going to focus on animation here, because if you've read the title, that's what this video is all about. In the early to mid 20th century, when animation was really being pushed forward as a medium by Disney, these different foundational ideas began popping up again and again. The animators didn't create these ideas on purpose, they just kind of discovered them as they animated and realized what worked and what didn't. These foundational ideas ended up being consolidated into the 12 principles of animation, which you can read about in the book Disney Animation The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, both members of the Nine Old Men, or Disney's core group of animators. The 12 principles of animation are as follows. Squash and stretch, anticipation, staging, straight ahead action and pose to pose, follow through and overlapping action, slow in and slow out, arc, secondary action, timing, exaggeration, solid drawing, and appeal. These principles emerged naturally in the 20th century as the Disney animators tried out new techniques and learned what worked and what didn't. The authors of the book, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, who had worked on films like Pinocchio, Fantasia, and The Jungle Book, also wrote about the future of animation, and they specifically expressed how difficult it was at the time to combine animation and live action footage in a believable way. Traditional animation and live action were first combined by Max Fleischer for his Coco the Clown shorts, while Disney would later take inspiration from this and create Alice's Wonderland in 1923. Computer or CG animation was first used in film with 1976's Future World, and audiences saw a computer animated Death Star in 1977. Moving on from just showing something animated on a computer screen, CGI was first combined with live action in the 80s with movies like Tron and Young Sherlock Holmes. The first fully computer animated feature wouldn't come until 1994 with the release of Toy Story. Now back to Bumblebee. Unlike the main Transformers series, which was directed by Michael Bay, Bumblebee was directed by Travis Knight, who previously served as a lead animator at Laika and directed 2016's Kubo and the Two Strings. Bumblebee marked Knight's first venture outside the world of stop motion, but he took his animation roots with him. He even employed storyboarders from Laika to storyboard this film in order to make sure the visual storytelling of animation would also translate into his first live action film. In this video, I'm going to look at the 12 principles of animation by examining a specific scene in Bumblebee, the scene where Bumblebee is left home alone. Charlie's off to work, and instead of just staying put in the garage, Bumblebee walks around the house exploring different human objects, causing a lot of destruction in the process. He's the only one home, besides the dog, and the scene is pretty removed from the context and plotline of the rest of the film, so it can be understood on its own. So I'll be using examples from this scene alongside traditionally animated examples. So without further ado, let Bumblebee teach you about the 12 principles of animation. First, there's squash and stretch. It has to do with exactly what the name suggests, squashing and stretching. These two ideas are opposites, but they go hand in hand. The easiest way to look at it is with a bouncing ball. When it starts to fall, it speeds up and stretches to show that speed. It eventually hits the ground and squashes. All that force is pushing it in this squashed shape. Finally, the ball stretches out again as it bounces back up. If you remove the squash and stretch, it visibly seems more solid, like a golf ball or something similarly hard. A lack of squash and stretch can be very effective namely to communicate information about an object or character's physical makeup to the audience. While a lot of squash and stretch conveys flexibility, 
a lack of it conveys rigidity. So how does Bumblebee squash and stretch? Well, he doesn't really. He's a robot, so it doesn't make sense for him to be that way, as opposed to softer and squishier 3D animated characters. So there's a lack of squash and stretch. Remember, these 12 principles are all about conveying some sort of information to the audience. In this case, the lack of squash and stretch conveys his weight and the limitations that his robotic form places on his flexibility. There is a very subtle amount of mechanical squash and stretch throughout the scene, like when Bumblebee does a little gasp and his face stretches out ever so slightly to communicate that. But otherwise, the general absence of any squash and stretch in the scene is used to emphasize the fact that Bumblebee is a huge, heavy robot. So that's one principle of animation down. Next is anticipation. Once again, the name says it all. When a character is gearing up to do something, say, jump, they anticipate it. They don't just pop up. They bend their knees and get ready for it. Things don't just happen. There is a clear sequence of actions which allow the audience to anticipate what comes next. Anticipation is shown by a character preparing for the main action. A good example of anticipation in the Home Alone sequence is pretty soon after Bumblebee busts out of the garage and into the main part of the home. We see him turn and spot something on the table and crouch down to get a better look at it. Next, it's revealed that he's looking at a soda can. Because of the anticipation, him turning and crouching, the audience already knows that he's curious about what this mysterious object could be. He gives the soda can a little tap before grabbing it and puncturing it. This is another example of anticipation, but there's less anticipation, just one tiny tap, in order to support surprise the audience with the soda bursting. So anticipation is used to introduce an idea to the audience, but a lack of anticipation can be used to create a surprise. Bumblebee uses both approaches in this scene in order to make sure the audience can understand what's going on, but not make it too predictable either. After this is staging. Staging doesn't simply refer to movement and action like these other principles so far. Staging has to do with one action clearly flowing to the next. An action is staged so that it is understood, a personality so that it is recognizable, an expression so that it can be seen, and a mood so that it will affect the audience. Staging helps make things clear. An important aspect of staging is the idea of directing the audience's attention to each action or idea. Blocking plays an important role in this principle. You need the camera to be far enough away to clearly show what a character is doing, or close enough to make sure the audience completely understands what the character is thinking or feeling. So where do we see this in Bumblebee? Well, one example of controlling what the audience sees through staging is when Bumblebee finds a coffee maker in Charlie's house. At first, it's staged close enough so that we, the audience, can see his curiosity in his eyes. It's not that close though, because we also need to see him move around his arms as he pours out the coffee and messes with the machine. Next, the staging is more distant because he has a big action that takes up a lot of space and the audience needs to see the complete action. We move into a close-up again to highlight Bumblebee and the plug, with a look at the dog before he begins to play with it. The various pauses throughout the scene are also useful to help the audience process what's going on. Since Bumblebee doesn't speak, everything is conveyed through his actions, and staging is very important to direct the audience's attention. An animator needs to show one distinct action at a time to make it clear what's happening. Next, there's straight ahead action and pose to pose. These are two different approaches to animation. Straight ahead refers to drawing one frame, then the next, then the next. It's good for keeping things spontaneous and fresh because you're just drawing as you go. However, that's not really how Bumblebee was animated. In CG animation software, instead of frames, there are keyframes, which are markers for each start and end point of a movement. After the keyframes are marked, the computer fills in the rest in between. So Bumblebee isn't straight ahead, it's pose to pose. Pose to pose is the animation method that applies to keyframe computer animation. In pose to pose, the important positions or poses are planned out and drawn ahead of time, and the in-betweens come after. Pose to pose is helpful because it offers maximum clarity, appeal, and communication. This technique is much more similar to the keyframes of modern computer animation. So pose to pose isn't found at a specific moment in the scene because it was part of the animation process itself. The next principle is another pair of ideas, this time follow through and overlapping action. This principle is centered around the idea that one part starts first and other parts follow. It can be seen most clearly when animating characters with loose flesh, as the fleshy parts of a body will move slower than the skeletal parts. Obviously, Bumblebee doesn't have loose flesh. What he does have, though, is a bunch of tiny mechanical parts moving together, and this allows for a ton of overlapping action. You see it when he's first entering the house, and he turns to take in his surroundings. His head zips around first, then his big lumbering body follows behind. The overlapping action helps convey the varying size and weight of Bumblebee's different mechanical components. 
And then there's the follow through, which is the way in which an action is completed, and how it all turns out. When Bumblebee hits a shelf while getting his bearings, he turns around, there's that overlapping action, in a visibly more careful way, and stares at it for a moment. The follow through for this simple action tells the audience that Bumblebee is trying to be careful. Now we're halfway through the principles of animation at number 6, slow in and slow out. This goes back to the idea of extremes and in-betweens that we looked at earlier with pose to pose. Slow in and slow out refers to the timing of the in-between frames from extreme to extreme. In animation, if a movement is comprised of a lot of frames, it will be slower. On the other hand, if a movement is drawn with just a couple frames, it will be snappier and quicker. For example, at 12 frames per second, an action made up of 12 frames will take one second to complete, while an action made up of three frames will take a quarter of a second to complete, or just 250 milliseconds. These concepts of frame spacing and timing can be applied to slow in and slow out. The idea is you don't want an action to be uniform, with a character moving the same amount in each frame. That just looks boring. Instead, by putting the in-betweens close to each extreme, and only one fleeting drawing halfway in between, you're able to get a very spirited result. It also puts emphasis on each of the extremes without wasting time showing the animation from point A to point B. So to examine this principle in Bumblebee, let's pick a movement. I'm going to look at the part where Bumblebee turns his head to look at the dog, because it's a pretty straightforward example. Here's every other frame from that movement. It's not necessary to go frame by frame here. So the two extremes would be when he's looking at the plug and when he's looking at the dog. The in-betweens are everything in between. Already you can tell there are more frames to show the beginning and end of this motion and less to show the actual turning of his head. This puts emphasis on the two extremes, or the two things that he's actually looking at, because that's what's important. Again, these 12 principles are all about highlighting what's important in an action, whether it's a physical movement or a feeling. Next is arcs. In nature, the movements of most living creatures will follow a slightly circular path or an arc. In animation, using arcs helps things look less mechanical and more lifelike. Now you might be thinking, wait, Bumblebee is mechanical. But remember, the point is to make Bumblebee appear more lifelike and human because that is how you get the audience to connect with him as a character. For this principle, I'm going to take a break from talking for a moment and just show you some different arcs in this scene. And there you have it. The arcs in Bumblebee's movement make him seem more alive and natural, which is especially important because he isn't physically human. This principle plays a crucial role in helping the audience identify with a character, and Bumblebee is one example of that. Following arcs, we have secondary action. Secondary action involves the main action or idea being strengthened by other gestures or actions, the secondary action. If a character cries, they might wipe away a tear too. It's a small action with a lot of effect. It definitely makes things more interesting for the viewer, but the primary focus here is emphasis. Take the moment where Bumblebee sits on the couch, for example. The first time, he almost sits on the dog. The primary action is him jumping up in surprise. The secondary action is him bringing his hands to his mouth and then reaching out towards the dog. This secondary action communicates that Bumblebee jumped up because he cared about the dog. Imagine if after he jumped up, he got all angry as a secondary action. That would communicate a different story, one where Bumblebee hates this dog for whatever reason. But instead, the secondary action is used to add to his jump and strengthen his characterization as a caring robot. Now, with the dog out of the way, Bumblebee sits down for real to watch Pong on the television. The primary action is him sitting down. That's simple enough. A secondary action here is Bumblebee putting his hands over his knees. He's basically bunching himself up as much as possible on this couch. And it's kind of a funny image. And that's the point here. The secondary action shows him as funny, even innocent, especially as he stays sitting even when the couch breaks. The secondary actions here help strengthen Bumblebee's characterization that predominates the scene. He's an innocent alien exploring Earth. The whole point of this principle is emphasis, specifically emphasizing the big actions with little ones. Next is timing. So this is something that, when it's described in the original book, is specifically related to traditional frame-by-frame -frame animation. Remember, most of the frames in CG animation are basically filled in by the computer after setting keyframes. But what this principle boils down to is this. If there is a lot of time between the extremes, meaning a lot of in-betweens in traditional animation, then that means the action is done slowly and thoughtfully. If there's a little bit of time between extremes, then the action is done quickly, suddenly, or unexpectedly. Timing involves movements with varying speeds in order to communicate different ideas and attitudes visually. Timing can be applied to the Home Alone sequence through the way that Bumblebee walks. 
At first, he's slow because he's in a new environment and he's being careful. His speed picks up a bit when he starts bumping into stuff, highlighting his surprise and unpreparedness. He gets his bearings for a moment and slows down, before getting surprised again and going very fast across the room out of control. And look at the variation of timing when he sits on the couch. He lowers himself down slowly, but jumps up quickly. That's because the sitting is done carefully, while the standing is a reaction to a surprise. The varying speeds help show the audience how Bumblebee is feeling in this scene. He's being as careful as he can, but he's also out of his depth in this new environment. After timing is exaggeration. Exaggeration does not necessarily mean distortion, although distortion does have its uses. Exaggeration is described by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston as a caricature of realism, with realism not exactly meaning photo and anatomical realism, but rather real things that a person would do. An animator should exaggerate a feeling or idea instead of exaggerating a character's body for no reason. The end result is a more convincing version of the original action. Exaggeration also helps ensure that the audience fully understands what's happening. One example of exaggeration is when Bumblebee is tumbling backwards, with his arms flailing around wildly. This lets the audience know that he's out of control. I know it might seem obvious, but that's exactly the point. Exaggeration makes things completely obvious, because the animator needs to know that ideas are conveyed properly to the audience. Second to last is solid drawing. When designing characters to animate, Disney animators searched for an animatable shape. Since animation obviously involves a lot of movement, a character needs to be ready to move. A word that was used a lot was plastic. The principle of solid drawing refers to the character design. Every aspect of a character's design needs to serve a purpose for the animator, so there shouldn't be any unnecessary visual detail that gets in the way of understanding. When I talked to some of the designers early on about the kind of emotional performance that I was hoping to get out of Bumblebee, I said, you need to simplify. As much as we can streamline what's happening in Bee's face, those things that then can move and be expressive are going to be that much more powerful. Another important aspect of solid drawing is eliminating twins, a situation where both arms or both legs are not only parallel but doing exactly the same thing. Throughout the Home Alone scene, we can see that even though it's subtle, each of Bumblebee's arms moves independently, and the same goes for the legs, especially when he leans over or bends his body. This principle is very important to CG animation because it gives the 3D character a sense of weight in the real world. The final principle of animation is appeal. The primary concern of any animator, or any artist or filmmaker for that matter, is to convey some sort of information or emotion to the audience. That's where appeal comes in. While the live actor has charisma, the animated drawing has appeal. Appeal is what draws audiences in. This principle does not only apply to sympathetic characters, but rather any character, situation, expression, or story that speaks to a viewer. A hero can have appeal. A villain can have appeal. Everything should have appeal. Again, an animator's goal is to communicate an idea to the audience. In order to make that communication as strong as possible, and in order to have appeal, you need to be simple and direct. If a character's design is too complicated, it becomes harder to understand. Appeal is seeing the characters think by a change of expression. It's no secret that human audiences like human characteristics in characters, because that's what makes them actually relatable and realistic. That brings us to Bumblebee's character design. A major difference between Travis Knight's version of Bumblebee and Michael Bay's version is the design. Bumblebee in the 2007 Transformers definitely had a strong, imposing figure, but a lot of the audience connection in that movie came from people connecting to the human character first and foremost, and then connecting to Bumblebee by extension. Travis Knight's iteration does still connect to Bumblebee through human characters, namely Charlie and even Agent Burns to some extent, but there is a lot more direct connection between Bumblebee and the audience through his appeal. Part of the reason that Michael Bay's Bumblebee didn't directly appeal to audiences is weak design in the face specifically. Human audiences like human characteristics, so the face is important. Travis Knight's Bumblebee design places much more emphasis on the face by making the eyes much larger and more expressive. Bumblebee's eyes allow him to communicate more clearly with Charlie throughout the film, and since the audience is meant to connect with Charlie, they connect with Bumblebee too. However, Bumblebee also gets some time alone with the audience through this Home Alone scene. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that this is the first time in the Transformers franchise where we see Bumblebee on his own. No other humans or Transformers around. That is part of what makes him such an appealing character. So those were all the 12 principles of animation. I know it was kind of a stretch at times, taking ideas formed around a specific type of animation and applying it to a different type of animation, but I think it's a worthwhile comparison because it shows how some of these fundamental ideas can still be seen today. I see a lot of people online say that with the mainstream shift in animation from 2D to 3D, the magic of animation has been lost, especially with the improved 21st century computer imaging technology that allows for more true-to-life realism. 
I don't really think that's true. Just because a lot of CG animation isn't in your face expressive, doesn't mean it's any less valid as an art form. I think that the artistry and craftsmanship that goes into CG movies, especially the hyper-realistic ones, is taken for granted by most audiences. Obviously, that hyper-realism can be taken to an ugly extreme, like with Lion King's emotionless faces. But it can also work, like with Toy Story 4's Dragon the Cat especially when you compare it to the dog in the first Toy Story from 23 years ago. Honestly, I think the reason we don't really appreciate modern animation advancements is because so much is happening right before our eyes. With early animation, like Disney animation, we're looking back years later at a select few great works. But when we're looking at current films, we're seeing a bunch of bad or just okay films with a few good ones popping up here and there. So it can be pretty easy to say that CG animation is bad or there's no magic or whatever, but that's a cop-out. Computer animation can communicate just as much as traditional animation. It's just a matter of having animators who are dedicated to telling a story to the audience through their art instead of just trying to make money. And that brings us to the end of this video. What do you think about all this? Should the 12 principles of animation even apply to 3D animation? Or should we come up with something else for new advancements? Leave a comment with your thoughts. If you want to see more content like this, subscribe to this channel so you don't miss it. My name is Kaylin, also known as Kiki Crazed, and thank you for watching.